Lynn and I were now going to be joined by what I discovered was a former student of mine. We discovered tonight that she was one of the 250 students who used to greet me there in Journalism 108. I get the um, first question. Yes. Was Bonnie any good? <laughs> <laughs> Lead in on that microphone, but if you're saying something nice, and back up from the microphone if you're saying something No, nice. Bill Bonnie was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a good time in that class, and Vic Vicari has gone on to become quite a, her name is Vicari Vollmer, and some of you may know her from her blog. What is your blog? My blog is So Vicarious. Aha, which fits with the name, very nice. Ah, yes. You said that you were named after a Vicky, so how is the name working yeah, out? Yeah, so uh, Vicky Vicari was my mom's very best friend when she moved to Michigan, and she ne my mom decided to name me after the whole family. So <sighs> there's a whole slew of Vicaris out there, but I've never actually met one with my first name before. That's an interesting first name, I like that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Well, I saw your blog the other day, you also work at TechSmith, so you're kind of a digital person, you are a web I design am, person. I am a digital person. I am a graphic and web designer at TechSmith, and I also blog on the side too. When did you start the blog, and tell me a little bit about it, because I think blogging goes, you know, periodically I hear blogging is the greatest thing, it's booming, life is wonderful, then I hear blogging is dead, then I hear again blogging is on the resurgence. When did you start yours and so what's your experience? I, I started my blog in October of last year. Um, I started it after a year of writing in my own personal journal by hand. Um, after a ended relationship, I was working on figuring out how to do life solo. So going through my personal journal and writing all these stories that I've experienced, um, one thing that's kind of universal among all of us, doesn't matter your background, emotions and feelings are felt by everyone. Yes. So I assumed that I couldn't be the only one feeling these things and decided that maybe it could have a little bit of mass appeal. And um, I didn't have any expectations for this blog. I even remember writing in my journal that all I wanted to do was maybe entertain some people um, and maybe secretly inspire, but I started this as the publicly consumable version of my own personal diary. How did you decide how confessional to be? Ooh, <laughs> good question. That's what prevented me from being a novelist. Yeah, so... Because <laughs> I thought of all the people I'd have to burn. Yes. <laughs> so the way I decide what to put out into the public eye, if you will, because you never really know who's reading right. these personal entries, was anything that I would feel comfortable telling my own parents and my family. Because if I wasn't okay with that, then it means that I, I don't want people who are not close to me to read these things. Um, there's, there's still a lot of withholding of information. I don't use last names. Okay. Um, I don't use any you know, topics that will generally make people uncomfortable, like religion or politics. That's not what, um, I guess, the theme of my blog is about. Right. But any any story that I feel comfortable telling a stranger, I will put out on my blog. Did you debate about using your name? Did you think about doing it anonymously? I did. Or using a, a made-up name? I did. Um, but, you know, Vakari is kind of a one-of-a-kind one thing. Right. Um, I debated a little bit about attaching my last name to it, um, but it's no different than having it out in a news article that you can find if you search me for Google, or, um, you know, my Facebook is private, but it's still accessible. Instagram is accessible. It's out there, so people are going to see it, so I was okay with it. Have you had any stalkers? I have not had any stalkers, and I would like Gosh. to keep it that way. Thank okay. you. I was just curious, because that <laughs> often happens with blogs, no yeah. matter what their content is. No, I know. It's definitely a concern, and it's a little frightening to think that there are not so good people out there that could be reading and viewing this, but I do try and be careful about where I'm from or um, you know places I visit or who I speak to. What about trolls? Because I had a shocking thing happen last week. I had a post and a friend of mine is married to a sort of famous uh, person. He's a member of, uh, of uh, Jack White's band, right? But she comes from a family that has some heavy duty, clearly, Fox viewing <laughs> family members who were not happy with some of my posts and all of a sudden, <clears throat> um, you know, like 10 trolls showed up and they were just like really awful. And everybody else that usually reads my stuff was horrified. Have you had to troll problems or had to censor some people? Fortunately, I have not had any troll issues. Wow. They have stayed under their bridges for now, but um, you know, it's still new. It's only been up since October and the following is growing, but I've been fortunate enough to have a pretty positive um, reaction to everything that I've written so far. I can imagine that maybe one day that will happen. Um, it's sort of the downside if you get yeah, to be successful. Yeah, it is. Do you find yourself 
becoming more looser with your standards about what you'll publish. That generally is a trend too. People again, they get comfortable and all of a sudden they're telling some secrets. I no, there will be no secret telling. Okay. <laughs> okay. Does, does no your employer telling. have any policy about blogging or social media? You use? know, TechSmith does not have any policy about blogging and actually a lot of my following are my coworkers. Um, oh really? Yeah, I'm blessed enough to have almost all of my best friends work at TechSmith and it's become sort of a family for the three years that I've been there. So generally most of the people to respond to it or read it are my coworkers. And again, maybe that goes back to what I consider when I put on this too. Yeah. Is that when I walk into work the next morning, <laughs> what did people find out about me and what are they going to say? Has your writing gotten better? Yes. And I don't mean it's bad. <laughs> no, but I, no. I'm just using an example. People that write in journals, their writing gets better. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a perfectly valid question, yeah. and it has. Um, even over the course of the May, eight, <laughs> eight months that I've been writing, I've gone back to a couple of the first entries, and it's the same style, same voice, but there's definitely been some improvement over the course of these entries. And even for my personal journal, too. Um, you know, you you practice things and you ultimately get better by doing them repetitively, hopefully. Things that I've interviewed probably, let's say 13 years times 50, six, about 600 probably authors. One of the sort of characteristics that's common is journaling. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. You can, you can ask them and 99% of them are gonna say at some point they journaled, kept diaries, or, or they call it sometimes keeping index card notes. But they all do it. Yeah, it ended up being a very therapeutic thing. And initially, in the past, I had started some, but never followed through. It would trail off after maybe a couple weeks or a handful of entries. And when I restarted and decided to actually devote time to this, I had to convince myself that this was not something that had to be perfectly polished. Um, there's no way right. to go back. It just It's too much time to sit there and edit your own personal dialogue. There's no point to it. The yeah. only person that's going to be reading this ultimately, hopefully, is myself. Um, so I gave myself the standards of, I always write in Sharpie so that I can't, there's no erasing and you know if, if there's a misspelling which my perfectionist brain kind of squirms at, it's just a cross out and keep going. It's a stream of consciousness and there's no structure to it, it's whatever wants to be said goes on the page and then it's done. You know, I had a situation where I married, you know, I have this, I'm sort of like voting in Chicago, marry early, marry often. Uh, my first husband contracted, I married young at 18, my first husband contracted melanoma during the first year we were married and took the next six and a half years to die. And I often said that I'm glad I lived long enough to be around with the internet here because I would have found blogging about that incredibly cathartic. Part of the problem for me, I know you were talking about this being loss and breakup and trying to reinvent yourself in a new persona on your own. I went through a similar circumstance when I was young and it would have been incredibly helpful to have had an opportunity to have felt that I was sharing that with the world and at least getting some feedback. Do you get supportive comments from people? I do, often yeah. actually. So I said earlier that I, I had no expectations for this, I secretly hoped to inspire. But the most beneficial part of this blog has been that we're all human and anyone that's read it can make a connection to it somehow with any kind of story that they've had in the past, like yourself. And to hear their stories has yeah. been the most rewarding part because after a post goes up, I'll get generally Facebook messages or text messages if they know me personally with some kind of snippet of what they're experiencing and what they've done with their life or things they've struggled with thanking me for being vulnerable and sharing my own personal experience so they had something to connect to um, or you know something to learn from and grow. How regularly, how frequently do you blog? I, I try to do it once or twice um, a month so okay. generally bi-weekly. It depends because life gets busy. Um, I told myself that I didn't want to put a restriction on this and force myself to do it so that it would become uh, a chore. Um, but so far that's been, that's been the schedule. How will you define success? Oh man, <laughs> I'm not really sure if I've gotten there yet, but so far... <laughs> I don't think numbers are the answer. Yeah, no, numbers aren't the answer because I don't, I don't really see this being something that's going to explode on the internet one day and have a massive following because that's, it's just storytelling. Not to say that that can't be powerful, but this isn't your typical gossip blog or food blog. 
Um, I'm not really sure what success looks like, but honestly, if I can help someone get through something tough or inspire in some way, that to me is success for now. The first website that I ever did was that my um, stepdaughter Kim died at the age of 34 from a combination of alcoholism and bulimia in 1996. Wow. And on the first anniversary of her death, I decided on a Wednesday prior to the Saturday anniversary that I would build a website memorializing that. And that meant I had to teach myself web design in three days and figure out how to do that in an era when it really wasn't that common. So fortunately, AOL had a thing called My Neighborhood, and I found a group of very supportive women called Spider Women of the Web, and they sort of helped me out. And I wrote Kim's story in 17 pages, and I put it up on the web, and what I did have which was in some ways a mixed blessing, was that I did have uh, an almost immediate success. This was at a time, I mean, we were dealing with Alta Vista. We didn't have Google. Um, you could find me under B for Bonnie. That's how you found me on <laughs> Yahoo. You know that kind of thing? Yeah. But I was, uh, within a few weeks, waking up and getting 60 to 70 emails a day from fellow bulimics and uh, anorexics around the world including one from a 15-year-old girl in Manila who said, I've never told anybody this, but my dad teases me every night at dinner that I'm the fat one who'll never get married, so I go into the bathroom afterward, put my finger down my throat, and throw up. But now my fingernails are peeling back and my hair is falling out, and I've never told anybody I need help. And that's when I realized both the power and also the sort of frustration of the Internet, because I obviously wrote that young woman an incredibly long and detailed email back and urged her to give you know get help and talk to me and I never heard from her again. Wow. And it's, those are kind of scary when you have these connections with people but you don't know how real they are, you don't know how to maintain them. It's a very odd medium, isn't it? I it mean, is. It's a very odd medium, but it's also a very incredible medium it because is. it offers connections that you wouldn't necessarily make on a day-to-day -day basis. 50-year-old women in Michigan don't have that many connections with a 15-year-old girl in Manila, you know. <laughs> no. I, mean, I don't know of any other medium that could have brought us two together. Right. Exactly. I had a man who was drinking himself to death in Paris write me and say, you couldn't have saved her. I mean, I had all of these, uh, I, I had a long friendship with a man in New Jersey who was trying to save his dying wife and failed. I mean, there were, these incredible things can happen mm -hmm. from blogging. And so you reach out and you don't know who you're going to touch. You have no idea who you're going to touch. And usually it's the most unexpected people. Um, I did a post a couple months ago about body image, and um, I was <laughs> I was a nude model um, for one of the shoots, and I, you know one of the people that connected with it that I did not expect was um, one of my coworkers who was a father of four. He has one girl, and he messaged me saying that he had hoped that he would be able to raise his daughter to have some kind of self-confidence that I displayed oh. because it's such a rare thing in this day and age to come out of teenagehood with that kind of personal image. So you have male readers as frequently yeah, as you think. I wondered about that. It, yeah, and I think that's what surprises me yeah. the most is that a 35-year-old man with four kids can find something to connect to in a blog oh. from a 24-year-old female. Do you, have you created any relationships with other bloggers in the community? Have they noticed you? So, um, yes and no. One of the blogs that I'm most connected to, but mostly because she's also a very best friend, is Whisk Kid. Um, she is a food blogger. And <laughs> she, <laughs> and, um, she, all of her journal entries are um, somewhat like personal diary stories that she connects to a recipe and then does amazing food photography. Um, so watching her blog, and it's, it's very successful in my personal opinion. Um, she's an incredible baker, an incredible storyteller, and seeing her following and a different kind of audience has been really incredible to watch and kind of inspiring for me too. The um, group called the Michigan Lady Food Bloggers, of which I am a member, they're mostly centered in Ann Arbor, but I watched that group grow from, I think there were first about 20 and then there were 40 and then there were 60 and that food blogging is just enormous. Mm -hmm. It is enormous and you know there's so many of them that I would imagine it's probably very difficult to stand out, but she has an interesting angle and her food is delicious. Well, there was, there was just the uh, woman who did the Lebanese cookbook here in Lansing. Yes. Um, can't think of her first name, but her last name is Abu. Yeah. But she was noticed on her blog. Oh, is and that she's, where? She's got a national contract for that. 
cookbook. I mean, it's not self-published. It's a big deal. It's quite beautiful. It's gorgeous. Yeah. But that was through a blog. Somebody discovered her. So, I it mean, people reviewed in the New York Times. New York Times. Yes. Two weeks ago, right? Yeah. Or three weeks ago, right? I have a little video on YouTube telling you how to shoot food photography, including how to make phony ice cream out of a lard. <laughs> Oh, yummy, yummy. That's, that's what they do in Alaska. Yeah, because it doesn't melt under the lights. Has you... your former breakup partner read your blog? Oh, you good know, question. I have no idea. Okay, I was wondering. Uh -oh. if you yeah, were... you know, I don't just... know. I wouldn't be surprised if he had stumbled upon it. Oh. Um, but we haven't spoken in nearly two years, so um, I have no idea. But if he has read it. Um, I'll hope that he'll be pleasantly surprised that there's nothing malicious or very uh, deeply personal about him um, because it's important to respect people's privacy. And we do see some revenge blogs oh, out there. Oh, absolutely. Mm. And it would be so easy to do something. How tempting. Yeah. Those are the things, though, that you write and put in the drawer. You exactly. Don't Those are the ones for the book that stays on the nightstand. Yes, that's and a very you good order idea. whoever's doing your estate to destroy him, which, of course, they never do. <laughs> yes, right, yeah. That's not good either. It's going to be interesting to see who owns those pixels after the Salinger case. I don't know quite how that's going to work. It's a wonderful thing. I'm so glad to hear that. I'd like to uh, move now into a little bit of a discussion about your work at TechSmith. Sure. You are a web designer there. And I would also like to bring Dr. Steve Wheeland into the discussion because he is with the College of Education at Michigan State. And just recently I was at the Neoliberalism in Higher Education Conference where Dr. Wheeland talked about What's happening with the whole digital revolution in terms of higher ed? But first I'll throw in so I don't have to do it again. This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. But I guess I'll start with you, Vicki. You are a lot self-taught in web design, right? Because it was not that easy to get an education. I am extremely self-taught. I'm only self-taught in any kind of web design, yes. And what are you seeing in terms of, um, TechSmith is also very involved with tools such as Camtasia that many faculty use to mm -hmm. try to do online education. What trends are you seeing in online ed these days? Well, you know, as far as web design goes, I'm still new. It's something that I am discovering because in college I did not have the formal education for web design. Um, a lot of my training has been done through, you know, self-teach websites like lynda.com or yes. digging, which is fantastic, or, you know, digging into this blog myself was a test in CSS and a little bit of HTML because I didn't know how to do this until oh. then. Um, so as far as what I've seen, you know, I can't speak to a lot of trends because I'm still new to this whole thing. I'm learning. Um, as far as digital in education, um, we were talking earlier a little bit about how massive online courses have grown in the past decade. And it's a pretty incredible thing to move away from the classroom and have access to education online from your own home. I built the first online course for police in 1998 and I had some elements in that that seriously I, I really wish they put in more courses now. For example, I had a little um, any of the special terminology we used about community policing, I had a little glossary terms in pop-up windows, sometimes with little, you know, graphs and so forth that would explain the terms, which I think are very handy, but we don't see much of that in online education. There are, I think the variability in online education is even greater than the variability of face-to-face -face instruction. Dr. Wheeland, what do you think about what's happening with digital education? It is a sort of mixed blessing, isn't it? Well, it's grown enormously, as we all know. In fact, <clears throat> most recent studies find that uh, about a third of all American undergraduate students are taking at least one online course. Wow. Now, I mean, that's the, that's the scale of it. Look at that uh, turnover in just that uh, many years. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's been very rapid and very comprehensive uh, in all sectors of American higher education, community colleges, uh, um, four-year institutions, graduate institutions, just about everyone is engaged in online education. And of course, the last few years with the advent of what's called, what are called MOOCs, in massive, massive open online courses, yeah. uh, the MOOCs are a product of the high end of the system. The most elite institutions are behind the production and uh, distribution of the MOOCs. So uh, it's fair to say that online education is spread across the whole system. It's it's only been growing. It is true, though, that it's not growing quite as fast as it was a few years ago. Right. It's still growing faster than the growth of enrollments generally, but it's not at the rates it was, say, three or four um, or five years ago. Uh, 
the, of course, anything that grows that quickly presents the terrific problems of understanding just what its impact is and whether it's achieving what it says it's achieving. And as you suggested, that, and I think text, TechSmith is a good example of how you know, we've rapidly, in the success of TechSmith, mm -hmm. demonstrates the, um, the interest that many people in higher education and, and nonprofits have for using most up-to-date and best designed tools, but uh, there are no real guidelines. It's a very open system. The uh, formats, approaches, styles uh, vary enormously. And I'm, now, I'm uh, old enough and been at this long enough to say that's terrific. That's what always made the university very good. That, lots of energy, that, lots yeah. of experimentation. And that, and that, you know, that people teach things in different ways. One problem, though, with digitalizing things is that it tempts us toward images of standardization. Yes, and I'll it tell does. you, here, last year, uh, this, uh, Lawrence Summers, who was the president of Harvard for many years until he ran into that problem. For good the, or ill, yes. Right, with his comments about the women and, and science. science. Mm -hmm. um, he spoke at the Aspen Festival, Aspen Festival last year. It happens that his wife teaches in the English department at Harvard. Uh, but even that didn't prevent him from wondering out, out loud and giving a talk why in the world we needed hundreds yes. of Shakespeare courses. Hundreds of Shakespeare courses. He said hundreds. And he said, why do we need that? Why can't we get have the get the best Shakespeare course and put it online and then everybody could watch it? Now, plainly, this, was a, 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 this sentiment was a product of his regard for MOOCs, right. where that seemingly demonstrates that you can put a good course online and hundreds of thousands of people can take it. Of course, his comment um, prompted precisely the response that, that uh, defenders of traditional higher education like to make, that the, the essence of teaching and learning are in, the, are in the differences, the different ways that people go about organizing a, a syllabus, designing a class, interacting in the, the classroom. It also uh, it, it reflects the enormous uh, the regional and institutional diversity of American higher education. Many people will say that's its, that's its genius. And, uh, so the idea of standardizing higher education is something that has created some uneasiness. Sometimes this also takes the form of what's now a very another, the, the trend this year, <laughs> MOOCs, MOOCs was, are so 2013 yeah, they're, they're or 2014, although the MOOCs continue to grow. There are hundreds of institutions now participating yes. uh, uh, across, all, all over you. the world. And actually, it's not just universities. The Smithsonian Institution, a lot of museums <laughs> yeah. produce MOOCs. And, um, that's, but um, that's, they're so 2013. <laughs> or two, the, the trend now, uh, especially in uh, uh, the, the um, lower division uh, parts of the university, the, the, the first two years, is uh, adaptive learning. And uh, mm -hmm. adaptive learning represents one feature of the MOOCs. When the MOOCs started, the, uh, their promoters claimed that it would, they would transform learning because the data produced by students interacting online with the online, with the courses, would demonstrate the, the, what individual students preferred in their pacing, yes. how well they did on exams, and we were told that this would transform learning and moves because theoretically that every student's participation could be customized and personalized because the computer would know how, the pace at which to introduce new work. This was the hope, the, the dream. Right. Now it's still, uh, the, this is big data at higher education. Yes. And, yes. Uh, but. Uh, to, uh, so the MOOCs promise that, uh, but the idea of the computer uh, uh, actually guiding instruction is now in place in a lot of institutions, especially in first and second year uh, math, statistics, courses. So that's the difference. Yeah. You know, I think they sold this whole concept a lot with, you know, I mean, if you're going to teach calculus, there are, there are certain rules and they don't change. They don't change. There are some courses that lend themselves exactly. to that. And in fact, uh, the Carnegie Mellon University is, gets yes. a lot less attention than a lot of others in the MOOC movement, but Carnegie Mellon's uh, online courses have no, it, there's no person associated with them uh, at all. They're totally uh, online by, via animation, demonstration, right. so, but they're brilliant. They're yeah, incredibly wonderful. expensive to make, but they're all on technical subjects, yeah. which are, I, they can be taught that way. But the MOOC, uh, the ideology of the MOOC, uh, to the degree that it promised custom learning that was both mass and customized, 
I, I think was very, very uh, misleading. I take right. my little craftsy art classes because they're nice and cheap and they have fabulous, interesting artists. Right. And you can go speed it up to 1.5, two times yes, the speed. Yeah, you can right. slow it down. Right, right. You can watch the last 10 seconds by hitting a certain button. They actually have more sophisticated technology for teaching those cheap classes than MSU has in D2L. Right. So, I mean, it's sort of, the higher ed, I don't think, has really understood or grasped this yet. Well, it's been, that's, that's very true, because higher education has leaned on the course management system or the learning management system, yes. and they vary enormously in what they can do. Some of us like to say they're too complicated. Right. That the, uh, you know, you can always, if you watch, say, a TED Talk. Yes. Or uh, some of the Coursera classes, the technology from the user end is actually pretty simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a few things you can do, uh, but D2L is designed largely, you know, the image that D2L appears to have is that every instructor is an engineer. Yeah. And they give you three different options to do the same. So lots and lots of things. In yeah. fact, let me give you an image you'll like uh, uh, that I love that describes the situation of the faculty member in designing online courses. Uh, Kevin Kelly, the technology writer who was the editor of Wired for years, and his way to the techno-utopian left, let's say, <laughs> what, isn't, it, isn't an app that Kevin Kelly doesn't love. He was behind the idea of the, the Universal Library that drove John Updike crazy <laughs> some years ago. You know, everything was that essay in the Times about everything being on the web, and then the idea was you would assemble the texts right. you liked from bits and pieces here and there. In any case, um, uh, Kelly is, was, is smart enough to recognize uh, certain counter pressures and uh, he's, he, he introduced the idea that I love of the slow geek. <laughs> Now, this I, I, I is it somewhat like the slow Loris? Well, is it's, by uh, here's, this is what he, he uh, had the chance to study the Amish use of technology, and uh, most people don't know the Amish actually are are in many ways very adept. I lived among the Amish for yeah. three years. So, but they're highly selective. They wait and see what yes, what do. what works. They don't operate according to theory, like the theory of online learning that I think is a problem for us <laughs> in the field. And he named them slow geeks. What they they're very selective, but what they choose to use, they're very dedicated to. I think that's a good way to describe a lot of faculty members in the way they they, they have a few things they really like, but they don't give themselves over totally to the digital transformation. But that sort of infuriates a lot of the the techno-utopian crowd, which wants adoption of every yes. gimmick, every possible technological innovation when it's they're probably not uh, required. There's something to say, by the way, about blogs in this regard, because blogs, uh, some years ago, in the transition to online teaching, had a very high had high status. There was a lot of talk, and a lot of us used blogs. They sort of disappeared from the technology, probably because they're not fancy enough. Uh, they're, yeah. they're, they're too simple. Uh, there is still, uh, by the way, a thriving uh, blogging uh, movement in higher education. Uh, and if you go, for example, uh, your listeners might be interested in uh, a fabulous website called Inside Higher Ed. Yes, it's great. Know, it's it? it's yes, wonderful. It's, it's free. Fantastic. You can go and sign up just insidehighered.com. A nice uh, news briefing turns up. Mm -hmm. But Inside Higher Education is a very good example of where blogging has gone in university life. It has migrated. There are a lot, of, a lot of still active independent bloggers, but a lot of it has migrated to websites. So Inside Higher Education supports two or three dozen walkers in different categories. And, uh, there the, used to be a magazine, Lingua Franca. Yes, but, it but was that was a little before. And it before. went out of business. But, but, but what, if it had been around with what, the web, it might have exactly, made it as a blog. Exactly. But what, um, as a website. It would have right. been a website. It would have been great as a and website. And it maybe wouldn't have called itself a blogging site. It would right. have simply called itself a website. But Inside Higher Ed, in some ways, is a blogging site because the blog change it started out as a journal and it still thrives as a journal or a diary or something but it morphed into what might be what used to be called the personal essay or the right. casual essay so uh, in, at, a, at a site like inside higher education lots of brief personal statements are classified as blogs they're not diary entries quite sometimes they're called postings sometimes not postings has survived as a well, but there's a lot of blogging still going on it's just changed in form and it, it's in, in the line is called. really almost non existent yeah. there's another fascinating feature of uh, of blogging in education uh, in that blogging is part of the debate about the fate of reading 
Yes. Now, there are many people who, now, who believe that reading, for, that traditional reading is declining because of changes in attention and the host of things that the distractions that many students The New York Times face. writer with his book The Shallows talking about right, yeah. our attention Nicholas, span Nicholas Carr. Nicholas has Carr. actually Right, shortened. and there's a lot of studies now showing yeah. that, that attention span is shrinking because of, of you know, the ubiquitous use of devices. Click, click, click. So, but there are some people who feel that actually that there's more reading than ever now because of the digital devices. And there's some very... But you skip from one to the other. Well, you do. I mean, the, 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 the nature of the reading has changed. And I myself don't believe... Too much in this, but there are those who say that young people, because of, they read blogs, they read websites, they do their their eyes are on on language. Let's say that's not the same thing as reading Joseph Conrad or whatever. Is but there are those who claim that blogging has actually brings more people into the experience of reading who might not do as much than otherwise, and I think that's a fair thing to say about the blog, people who follow blogs who might not otherwise be reading much at all, but they're reading because there are blogs. You think, wanted to jump in. Well, there's a few things. I, in the most recent, I think libraries will tell you that same thing, that blogging has contributed to reading in yeah. huge numbers. Uh, they can almost trace directly to a blog what people are reading. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, though, when you were talking about this new technology and sort of like the Larry Summers role, it reminded me of programmed learning when I was in college. Yeah. Where you you could you only go on to the next page after you learned the previous page, and a guy named Persig was one of the people that worked on that who wrote the guide to motorcycle maintenance. If yep. anyone, Robert Persig, yes. yes, he was he designed program That's learning. That's how it started. He started. Yeah. He was at MSU for yeah. a short time because I met him. Persig was here. Yes, you met him. Yeah, yeah. Motorcycle maintenance is my favorite book of all time. Yeah, but can you see how it's based on program learning? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, that is no longer around really, but they have tried to adapt it to the web. But when you're talking about what Larry Summers said about uh, Shakespeare, it probably wouldn't have included the professor I had, probably my junior year, who taught us about some of the keener things about Shakespeare, like farting. Uh, <laughs> he, he would fart in the classroom. Mm -hmm. the sweet I mean, you have to work that into an online <laughs> well, it, course. It works, too. There, right. there must be a technology. But how do you test an for audio to see technology. if they're really doing it? And where yeah. it appears yeah. in, other Shakespeare, in the works of Shakespeare, and he'd throw tomatoes at us. There's an app for that. There's yeah. an app for that. I mean, he would not... You would make it probably in an online world, but Larry wouldn't like that, would he? No. Because it was too unique. But you can never forget those things in the learning experience. There'll be an app to measure the hydrogen sulfide in the air to see if you... <laughs> of course, Larry Summers isn't worried about uh, the enrollments in his wife's classes. No. No. I mean, see, Harvard he... will... Nothing, nothing's going to... There's no threat to Harvard in this, but right. there's a threat to lots of other institutions. And We're sitting here at LCC, at LCC Radio, right. WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan, and we're talking with Dr. Steve Whelan and also with Vakari Volmar, and uh, she's with TechSmith, and we're talking about the future of online education. What we were hearing, though, is that a lot of the people out in Silicon Valley uh, sort of envision this future, uh -huh. where you'll have one brilliant professor who'll give the or lecture on whatever it is that you're talking about, right. and then you'll have a uh, small group, well, uh, a significant group of low paid facilitators in a little, sort of like graduate assistants, but right. not even probably right. paid that, and that well. And that's, and, and that's the image that, that's that the image MIT they like. and Harvard had just a few years ago as yeah. they organized the MOOC uh, movement. And that's still a source of enormous interest in, uh, uh, around the country. That is, that is how MOOCs will ultimately, if they do, fit into the credit curriculum. And right. that's what brings us to the the role of the Silicon Valley engineers and the venture capitalists and why MSU actually organized this conference on a pretty abstract and in some ways a, a, a obscure idea like neoliberalism which is the complicated political phenomenon. Right. But the, the, um, uh, the, the role of, of online education is, is, not, is not as complicated as that in the sense that what online education represents uh, from the neoliberal perspective is a, a perfect representation of bringing more uh, efficiency and measurement and mainly privatization to higher education. Kind of and, like making the trains run on time. Well, there's an element of that Mussolini that you can, you can <laughs> standardize and regulate it. Right. But the key point, and you see this in some books published this year, this has been a big season uh, this spring 
for visionary books on higher education based on online learning. Uh, the, the one that's had the most attention is Kevin Carey's book called The End of College, which came out a few months ago and has been covered in all the newspapers. I'm and reading so on. it now. Yeah, and his image of things pretty much represents the view from Silicon Valley yeah. on this, and that is by the, when they, that the end of co college is nothing to be afraid of and because if we leave, like everything else, if we leave it to the engineers in Silicon Valley, ultimately they'll provide us with enough online learning opportunities so everybody, as Carrie puts it in his image of the university of everywhere, right. or as others call this the DIY, do-it-yourself approach to mm -hmm. learning, we won't need brick-and-mortar institutions or professors or anything because everyone will assemble their own curriculum. undergraduate degrees or curriculum from the vast array of online resources that'll be out there. That would include MOOCs. And once the universities have closed, there'll be lots of people who can set up shop and little startups offering education experiences of all kinds. And then ultimately in this vision of the University of Everywhere, Perhaps new kinds of institutions will emerge who will credential people, give them badges or certificates or credentials of some kind, and employers will adapt, and we will be free of you know, the habits and routines of the old universities who only understood seat time, credit hours, you know, four or five year degrees, and we will have liberated ourselves into a much more um, uh, uh, open sort of system. And it, of course, it, it fits perfectly with what you see which happened. I mean, years ago people went to work for one company, maybe right. they two in their lifetime. Uh, I remember when I first started teaching, when Vicari was in my class, I was using a secretary of labor who said you'd have to have seven careers in your lifetime. They're now saying you'll have to have seven careers by the time you're 40. So you will be reinventing yourself constantly after graduation right. from college. So even if we maintain the four-year institution right. as one kind of teaching environment, you're going to have to go back and figure out a way to re-educate yourself. And you can't afford a hundred grand each time for another master's. Right. So you're going to have to use these online resources. Very good. Did you take any online classes learning I did. web design? What, what did you think of them? Uh, you know, I learned by doing. So to follow an online course, and granted this was not a college course. This was this was a lynda.com tutorial, if you Which will. Are as good They're as excellent. Which They're excellent. Yeah, as they, as they were excellent. It was very easy to follow along to what they were showing me and then giving myself a project to practice these things. Now, that being said, I did take college courses when I was in MSU and I was not a fan because um, I enjoy having a human being in front of me so that I have that immediate access of being able to ask questions and interact with them and have a conversation. In the online courses that I have, there was a barrier there because I would have to access that professor through email right. or and wait for a response, or I would have to IM them if they were available to chat at that hour. But generally, all of my work was done late in the evening. They're not available at that minute to answer my questions or offer help. Um, one of the things that I see changing, and we have this available in TechSmith products too, is that we're offering green screens so that teachers can record themselves giving these lectures as they would in the classroom so that they still have that kind of interpersonal connection when you're watching these videos. There's somebody actually talking to you. Now, whether or not you get in that immediate access to them through communication, it, to me, it felt better. See, the somebody. brilliance of a lynda.com is those are really not classes, they're tutorials. Correct. They're the kinds of things where you want... I mean, Linda was part of the training. Linda Weinman, I knew her through Spider Women of the Web, and she was one of the early web design lists I was on. Bill gave and me a hard time. She made how much day. money? $2.6 billion. And what she did just you sold lynda.com. And you could have done that. No. <laughs> yes, you could have. No. But you know, as I told you, Bill, then I would end up gardening in my hoop house and painting tomatoes, but I'm doing, doing that, so it wouldn't have made any difference. But she and I were part of the training team that went out um, to the Web Cities uh, in the early 2000, 1999 and 2000. And uh, I mean, it was a very exciting era, and it was the time of the boom where we thought that the web was going to do everything immediately and wonderfully. And then there was the crash. So we do see this sort of boom and bust cycle. And I think we're seeing boom and bust in higher ed with us. And of course, it, it, you know, this sort of vision of the University of Everywhere, free of institutions, is very well suited to what's often called this sort of neoliberal approach to public services. You yes. know, it's, it, so yeah. you say, well, the state doesn't want to invest in education anymore. Uh, it's investing much, much less. And at the, the, from the neoliberal perspective, that's a good thing. 
Instead, you know, the people should They're be, substituting corporate values you know, you, for economic values. Well, or the corporate values of the providers. They're all tech companies who love right. this. Right. It's great But the them. idea, then, is to privatize the whole system. Why should the state have much of a role at all? Silicon if, Valley is yeah. offering kids 100 grand to drop out of college. Some, yeah. Quite Peter Thiel, who was yeah. the behind pen pal, he's one of the chief promoters of this idea. If you're, some of your listeners haven't seen the uh, uh, documentary, uh, Ivory Tower, it came out about a year and a half ago. He's uh, featured in uh, Ivory Tower, but he's one of several, like Reed Hoffman at LinkedIn is another one who published an essay yeah. last year on why do we need degrees at all. Right. Yeah. It's a very popular idea. Oddly enough, now, we're old, and you're not old enough to remember, even, <laughs> even Illich, who was a philosopher oh, of education from yeah. the 70s and 80s, who published a book in the 70s called De-Schooling Society. Yes. Now, his ideas were very different. This was pre-technological. And he was looking more at what would be called traditional institutional reform. But there is right now a really big de-schooling movement right. in higher education. Yeah. And you get some odd relationships. Oh, just imagine in a system with no... That one of the great things that university does is they stabilize expertise and credentialing. Right. And that's been a very valuable force. Now, it's uneven in some ways, and there may be too much of it now, but the uh, uh, the neo the uh, Silicon Valley promoters and venture capitalists behind this are very skeptical about the sort of traditional role that higher education plays. And there's another move. Mozilla, for example, has been putting a lot of support into the, the the movement with badges. That is, alternative forms of certification. Uh, now, this could come about. We issue them through, in some of our classes. Yeah, you know, this could come about through you know, a host of new institutions. Now, the, the problem is, that, you know, to, to be skeptical of these, you know, this flurry of proposals in the last year or two, isn't to say that there aren't things that could change in higher education. I mean, it's like every institution, it's, it's variable. And there, there's, there's, there's room for experiment to do different things. The problem, though, and you saw this at the conference, is the sort of apocalyptic vocabulary in which this is typically presented. The higher the Silicon Valley line in crowd insists on saying the system is broken, right? Needs That's to be disrupted. Uh, there's a tsunami. You know, there's a tsunami coming. The president of Stanford said. Uh, the another theorist talks about the earthquake we're facing or the avalanche. And the, my favorite is that uh, John Seeley Brown, who's a favorite sort of philosopher, of all this talks about the Cambrian explosion we're living through. Now, that's a pretty big statement. But you know so, how they're going to sell this. They're going to yeah. say, look, tuition is out of control. Right. And Kids that's the great. That's right. So the, this, this is, is the way we'll do. control costs. We'll yeah. control costs. We'll they won't, yeah. of course. You won't yeah. get much of a break. You might get 10% off, and you're yeah. still going right. to be seeing, you know, just as with health care. Right. But the reality is that we have a strange system now where we've seen fixed term and adjuncts taking up a greater and greater, you know, the tenured faculty yeah. are down to about one out of every four instructors. But now. the truth is that that was introduced in order to save money, but such has been the growth of administration. In exactly. education. Didn't it's been a wash. It's, there's no, you, nobody's controlling costs that way. No, and well, they won't with this yeah. either. Although there's some who believe, and there have been some experiments in the last year, that if you introduce more adaptive learning and automated teaching into, there are about 10 or 15 courses that are the biggest courses at every university. Yeah. Uh, Econ yeah. 101, the remedial math courses, and there's some, and there may be some good reason for this. We agreed before that in some subjects like math, but see what you can do this. Me. Yeah. To my mind, econ hasn't evolved. I'm a sort of fan of Kali Lawson of Adbusters up in Canada who said the big problem is all these kids go through these econ courses and the research shows they become less empathetic by the time they get out. They just want right. to view everything in terms of dollars and cents and they all embrace these corporate values. If we don't have scholarship going on at universities nationwide, the field doesn't change, the field doesn't evolve. I think econ got stuck in the 50s myself. What we need is more scholarship in that area, not one ur prof saying this is the text that everybody reads. And I think that's part of the challenge with this standardization. Mm -hmm. We're now seeing more and more of, I see the pressures in my school. Well, what should a journalist know at the end of their four years or five years here? Let's develop a test to see whether they actually learn that, and then let's teach right, to the right. test. Well, that's machine learning right there. I mean, that's easily adaptable to a machine environment, but that lacks the kind of energy that allows us to create a new field. I mean, being able to produce something new, as Linda Weinman did, she created real value with what she did. It was a new way of teaching, you know, that was, was something very exciting for people who wanted to learn about this. Another thing it does is it sort of eliminates or 
doesn't distinguish mentorship anymore. Oh, yeah. exactly. I mean, there are people in, that I went to school and had as professors, and the majority probably weren't the best, but there were some that were so good that changed your life. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're right. going to get that on blind. Yeah. And there are, there are very, I mean, wonderful uh, sort of skeptics and opponents. Maybe the best is Andrew Del Banco at Columbia, whose book from a couple of years ago, um, simply called College, what it was, what it is, and what it should be, is, what, is a spokesman, for, just as you say, for the personal dimension and, and mentoring. I, I should add, though, that it's, it's odd. Uh, this movement, this apocalyptic movement, it's not a threat to MSU or the University of Michigan. No. Uh, probably not a threat even to, say, Central Michigan, or oddly enough to the community college, which yeah. is strongly rooted in a law and has a pretty good idea of its, its mission. But there are thousands of institutions, small liberal arts colleges, small state universities, well, they're, the, they're the ones who are, who are threatened. That's going to be an interesting. And I've got to get you back. I've got to get both of you back to talk about this because this, is, to me, is really one of the most exciting things to think about how we're going to reinvent higher ed for good or ill.